Good evening. Welcome to the New York Society Library. Um, is there anybody in the room who doesn't have a seat who needs a seat? Everybody's okay. Thank you. We've got a big crowd. Uh, my name is Sarah Holliday. I'm the library's head of events, and I'm just here momentarily to say that we're delighted to have you with us this evening. Uh, for those of you new to the library, we are the oldest library in the city and one of the oldest in the country, founded in 1754. We acknowledge that the library now stands on the traditional land of the Lenape people to whom we pay respect. From the beginning, we've been a library for both readers and writers, so we're pleased to be able to offer a vibrant season of events with authors. Major events are generally open to the public like this one, so please take a look at our website or speak to a staff member to join in. I do want to mention that we have our friends from C-SPAN's Book TV filming this evening, so the whole presentation is being photographed, filmed, and live streamed. Um, please keep that in mind um, as you enjoy the event. So, gotta brag, the library's historic member writers included Willa Cather, who used the library in our collection over a number of years, both in our prior building on University Place and in this building, where we moved in 1937. From the surviving charging records, we know that both Cather and her partner, Edith Lewis, visited the library and checked out quite a few books, both for research and for general reading. Our 2017-2018 exhibition, The New York World, Willa Cather, often heard a lot about Cather's life in New York and her use of this library, so please feel free to speak to a staff member or take a look at our website to learn more. We'll also continue our Cather sesquicentennial celebration with a special event featuring Benjamin Taylor on his brand new biography, Chasing Bright Medusas, A Life of Willa Cather, coming up on November 14th. Because of that historic connection, we're particularly honored this evening to present this special event celebrating the sesquicentennial of Cather's birth in cooperation with the National Willa Cather Center. Our great thanks to Peter Tchaikovsky from his Board of Governors, who's brought us this event. And I will now hand the stage over to him. Thank you and enjoy. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Peter Tchaikovsky with the National Gather Center, uh, and I'm here with some of my colleagues from the center, uh, particularly Ashley Olson, our executive director in Red Cloud, Nebraska. We are so excited to be here to be partnering with the Society Library. Uh, Willa Cather's birthday is this uh, December, and it is the 150th anniversary of her birth in 1873. Uh, it's important to state that, uh, as Sarah suggested, that Willa Cather was a member of the library. She was a quintessential New Yorker in the sense that she lived here most of her adult life down in the village before migrating to the Upper East Side. She was a member of the library down on University Place uh, for those years. Uh, uh, when she was living in the village, and uh, later when it migrated here. In fact, she did a good deal of research in this space, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, and used the card catalog, and there's a good deal of evidence here in the library that she researched a number of her books. In particular, her last book, Sapphira and the Slave Girl, which was based on some memories, memories she had of her childhood uh, in Virginia. Uh, as you may know, she migrated with her family to Nebraska when she was nine years old. And we know her, of course, for her Nebraska novels primarily, where she wrote so beautifully uh, about uh, the landscape there. Uh, I think I'd also like to point out that, that Willa Cather brings a kind of unique American voice uh, and kind of broke the code, so to speak. She followed her great mentors, uh, Edith Wharton and Henry James, who were writing about very different themes. Uh, they, they were writing about, about aristocrats, uh, folks who had European tours and so on. Willa Cather wrote about common people, the people that she grew up with and, and loved and, and found a way to express what it was to be quintessentially American through, through, her, through her novels. Tonight's program uh, is brought to you uh, both by the National Willa Cather Center and the New York Society Library. Uh, just a word about what we do at the center, uh, which is based in Red Cloud, Willa Cather's hometown. Our mission is to advance Willa Cather's work, obviously, uh, and to also protect the largest national, uh, nationally desi designated historical landmarks uh, attached to one author uh, in Red Cloud. So I encourage you to come to Red Cloud uh, and, and have a look around its extraordinary place. And the center has a magnificent 
originally uh, opera house where, where really Cather uh, performed as a, as a girl, uh, as well as an archive and a library and, and, and so on. But all that remains, I think, is to say thank you again for, for being here. Uh, it's a, a special uh, uh, year uh, for, for the Willa Cather Center. Uh, thank you so much to the National Willa Cather, uh, uh, I your pardon, thank you to the uh, New York Society Library for, for hosting us. Uh, and now I think it remains for me to welcome our, our actors, uh, Steve Rotman and Diane Lorette. Uh, thanks to them for being here. Will it happen? <laughs> Letter to Mrs. Stowell, age 14. August 31, 1888. Dear Mrs. Stowell, when I received your letter, I was much pleased, for I had begun to doubt your intention to write. School begins Monday, and I suppose I shall go, but I do not feel buoyant over the prospect. <laughs> I have grown so attached to my work in my little laboratory where I have a dissecting outfit. It's hard to leave my animals. Here, I am Miss Cather and governed. There, I am a child and am governed. That makes a great difference with frail humanity. I have been stopping birds lately. Your affectionate friend, William Cather. Letter to Louise Pound, age 20. June 29th, 1893. Dear Louise, morning. Your card just received. Another disappointment. Never mind, I am getting used to them now. I will be into Lincoln the 4th, 5th, and 6th of July. You will be gone then. Again, fate. I don't know that I should call to see you anyway. I have set my stipulations. You do not deign to say whether you intend coming down when we return from Chicago. For goodness sake, make up your mind then and come. If you don't come, consider matters eternally cut short next year. It has been too much a one-sided game. I don't want to be under obligations to anyone, even you. Oh, do come, my dear fellow. I can't help thinking you don't come because, well, you know what? I have tried one whole year to efface that, tried as hard as I ever tried to do anything. For mercy's sake, come down and show me I am forgiven. If you don't come at all, remember, it is goodbye. Willem. Letter to Witter Binner, age 33. February 24, 1906. Dear Mr. Binner, thank you for returning my story, which I think I have been able to improve somewhat. You asked me about my novel. Indeed, you asked me about it once before, and I neglected to answer your question. The truth is that I had not taken it out of the wrapper in which you sent it back to me, nor even opened it until some weeks ago when I needed a piece of string. <laughs> it was the one which you had put around it in your office. So, you see that I have done absolutely nothing with it. It seems to be not quite bad enough to throw away and not quite good enough to wrestle with again. Therefore, it reposes on my old hat box. I do think it was most oddly zealous of you to put in a word to Mr. Henry James and call his attention to my collection of stories. And I know that you must think his reply with your pains. It's such a strikingly personal communication, although it's about something toward which he declares himself dead. Mr. Binner, I wish to acknowledge receipt of the Troll Garden and confess to not reading it or intending to read it. <laughs> Promiscuous fiction has become abhorrent to me, and I find it the hardest thing in the world to read almost any new novel. Any is hard enough, but the hardest from the innocent hands of young females. <coughs> young American females, perhaps above all. This is a subject, my battered, cynical, all too expert outliving of such possibilities, on which I could be eloquent. But I haven't time. And I will be more vivid and complete some other day. I've only time now to say that I will then, in spite of these professions, do my best for Miss Cavett, so as not to be shamed by your so doing yours. Respectfully, Henry James. Mr. James's letter has given me a very keen kind of satisfaction. <laughs> for the attitude he admits is so exactly which one would expect him to have. <laughs> 
I've always known that he must feel just so, but it's comforting, all the same, to have it from him in black and white. If Mr. James and one or two other men did not feel just as he affirms about, well, it would really break one's spirit. It would be a very deep personal hurt. It's the unshrinking positiveness of his statement as to his estimation of the value of what he terms promiscuous fiction <laughs> that makes Mr. James's letter a kind of moral stimulant. You shall see with what good grace I can stand up to whatever punishment he meets out to me in his second letter to have had the satisfaction of the first. In anticipation of a second letter, however, I certainly do ask for sympathy even though he should refine a woman's treatment in the light of the presupposed youth and innocence of the subject. I feel a good deal as if I were about to undergo a searching physical examination from which I should come away with my formal unsuspecting confidence in the ordinary dependableness of my organs forever shaken, or worse still, with my doubts horribly confirmed. <laughs> the prospect of his doing what he calls his best by me, well, wouldn't you now, were you actually facing the prospect of such an attention, have to whistle to keep up your courage? So, I'll ask your sympathy and beg you, when you get his diagnosis, to let me have it faithfully and soon. Faithfully, Willis Siebert Catherine. The Song of the Lark, part one. Herr Wunsch, an old Fritz and Spanish Johnny, celebrated Christmas together so riotously that Wunsch was unable to give Taya her lesson the next day. <laughs> In the middle of the vacation week, Taya went to meet her piano teacher through a soft, beautiful snowstorm. The air was a tender blue-gray, like the color of the doves that flew in and out of the white dove house on the post in the garden. The sand hills looked dim and sleepy. The tamarisk hedge was full of snow, like a foam of blossoms drifted over it. When Taya opened the gate, old Mrs. Coleman was just coming in from the chicken yard with five fresh eggs in her apron and a pair of old top boots on her feet. She called Taya to come and look at a bantam egg, which she held up proudly. Her bantam hens were remiss in zeal, and she was always delighted when they accomplished anything. <laughs> she took Taya into the sitting room, very warm and smelling of food, and brought her a plateful of little Christmas cakes, made according to old and hallowed formula, and put them before her while she warmed her feet. Then she went to the door of the kitchen stairs and called, Herr Wunsch! Herr Wunsch! Herr Wunsch came down wearing an old wadded jacket with a velvet collar. The brown silk was so worn that the wadding stuck out almost everywhere. He avoided Taya's eyes when he came in, nodded without speaking, and pointed directly to the piano stool. He was not so insistent upon the scales as usual, and throughout the little sonata of Mozart she was studying, he remained languid and absent-minded. His eyes looked very heavy, and he kept wiping them with one of the new silk handkerchiefs his landlady had given him for Christmas. Taya, loitering on the stools, stool reached for a tattered book she had taken off the music rest when she sat down. It was a very old edition of the piano score of Gluck's Four Fakes. She turned over the pages curiously. Is it nice? She asked. It's the most beautiful opera ever made, <laughs> Wunsch declared solemnly. You know the story, eh? How when she died, Orpheus went down below for his wife. Oh, I know the story. I, I didn't know there was an opera about it. Do people sing this now? Ah, yeah. <laughs> what else? You, you like to try? See? He drew her from the stool and sat down at the piano. Turning over the leaves to the third act, he handed the score to Taya. Listen, I play it through and you get the rhythms. Eins, zwei, drei, vier. He played through Orpheus's lament, then pushed back his cuffs with awakening interest and nodded at Taya. Now, Vomblat mit mir. 
Vaughan sang the aria with much feeling. It was evidently one that was very dear to him. No, I'm not alone, yes, sir. He played the introductory measures, then nodded at her vehemently, and she began. When she finished, Wunsch nodded again. Sure. He muttered as he finished the accompaniment softly. He dropped his hands on his knees, looked up at Thea, that is very fine. There is no such beautiful melody in the world. You can take the book for one week and learn something to pass the time. It is good to know all of this. He sang softly, playing the melody with his right hand. Taya, who was turning over the pages of the third act, Stop and scowled at a passage. The old German's blurred eyes watched her curiously. For what do you look so immure? <laughs> Puckering up his own face. You see something a little difficult, maybe, and you make such a face like it was an enemy? <laughs> Taylor laughed disconcerted. Well, difficult things are enemies, aren't they? When you have to get them. Wunsch lowered his head and threw it up as if he were butting something. Not at all, by no means. <laughs> he took the book from her and looked at it. Only one woman could sing that good, Wunsch went on. It is written for alto, you see. A woman sings the part, and there was only one to sing that good in there, you understand? Only one. He glanced at her quickly and lifted his red forefinger upright before her eyes. Taya looked at that finger as if she were hypnotized. <laughs> Only one? She asked breathlessly. Her hands hanging at her sides were opening and shutting rapidly. Wunsch nodded and still held up that compelling finger. When he dropped his hands, there was a look of satisfaction in his face. Was she a very great? Wunsch nodded. <coughs> was she beautiful? <laughs> she was not so uh, big mouth, big teeth, no figure, nothing at all, a, a pole, a post. <laughs> but for the voice, ah, she has something in there behind the eyes, tapping his temples. Taya followed all his gesticulations intently. Was she German? No, Spanish. Long face, long chin. And such sun. Did she die a long while ago? Die? I think not. I never hear anyhow. I guess she is alive somewhere in the world. Paris, maybe. But old, of course. I hear her when I was a youth. She is too old to sing now, anyway. Was she the greatest singer you ever heard? Wunsch nodded gravely. Quite so. She was the most. He hunted for the English words, lifted his hand over his head, and snapped his fingers noiselessly in the air, enunciating fiercely, Kutzler ich! The words seemed to glitter in his uplifted hand. His voice was so full of emotion. Wunsch rose from the stool and began to button his water jacket, preparing to return to his half-heated room in the loft. Taya regretfully put on her cloak and hood and set out for home. When Wunsch looked for his score late that afternoon, he found that Taya had not forgotten to take it with him. He smiled his loose, 
sarcastic smile and thoughtfully rubbed his stubby chin with his red fingers. When Fritz came home in the early blue twilight, the snow was flying faster. Mrs. Kohler was cooking in the kitchen and the professor was seated at the piano playing the group, which he knew by heart. Old Fritz took off his shoes quietly behind the stove and lay down on the lounge before his tapestry, where the firelight was playing over the walls of Napoleon in Moscow. He listened while the room grew darker and the windows duller. Wunsch always came back to the same thing. I shall see the loving for my blue is soon dying. Where over is the born? Where does he show fair on me? Where does he show fair on me? Your little. From time to time, Fred sighed softly. He too had lost a Eurydice. Maya Antonia. I first heard of Antonia on what seemed to me an interminable journey across the great Midland Plain of North America. I was 10 years old then. I had lost both my father and mother within a year, and my Virginia relatives were sending me out to my grandparents, who lived in Nebraska. <laughs> I traveled in the care of Jake, a mountain boy, one of the hands on my father's old farm under the Blue Ridge, who was now going west to work for my mother. Jake's experience of the world was not much wider than mine. He had never been in a railway train until this morning when we set out together to try our fortunes in a new world. We went all of the way in the ages, becoming more sticky and grimy at each stage of the journey. Jake bought everything the news boys offered him, candy, oranges, brass collar buttons, a watch charm, and for me, a life of Jesse James. <laughs> Beyond Chicago, we were under the protection of a friendly passenger conductor who knew all about the country to which we were going and gave us a great deal of advice in exchange for our confidence. He seemed to us an experienced and worldly man who had been almost everywhere. In his conversation, he threw out lightly the names of distant states and cities. He wore the rings and pins and badges of different fraternal orders to which he belonged. Even his cuff buttons were engraved with hieroglyphics. He was more inscribed than an Egyptian obelisk. <laughs> Once, when he sat down to chat, he told us that in the immigrant car ahead, there was a family from across the water whose destination was the same as ours. I did not remember crossing the Missouri River or anything about that long day's journey through Nebraska. Probably by that time, I had crossed so many rivers that I was dull to them. The only thing very noticeable about Nebraska was that it was still all day long. Nebraska. <laughs> I had been sleeping, curled up in a red plush seat for a long while when we reached Black Hawk. We stumbled down the whole train into a wooden siding where men were running about with lanterns. Couldn't see any town or even distant lights. We were surrounded by utter darkness. The engine was panting heavily after its long run. In the red glow from the firebox, a group of people stood huddled together on the platform, encumbered by condiments and boxes. I knew this must be the immigrant family the conductor had told us about. The woman wore a fringed shawl tied over her head, and she carried a little tin trunk in her arms, hooking it as if it were a baby. There was an old man, tall and stooped, two half-grown boys, and a little girl clung to her mother's skirts. Presently, a man with a lantern approached them and began to talk, shouting and exclaiming. At her. I pricked up my ears, for it was positively the first time I've ever heard a foreign tongue. <clears throat> Another lantern came along. A bantering voice called out, Hello, are you Mr. Burden's folks? If you are, it's me you're looking for. I'm Otto. 
but Mr. Burton's hired man and I'm to drive you out. He told us we had a long night drive ahead of us and we'd better be on the hike. He led us to a hitching bar where two farm wagons were tied and I saw the foreign family crowding into one of them. The other was for us. Jake got on the front seat with Otto and I rode on the straw on the bottom of the wagon box covered up with a buffalo hide. The immigrants rumbled off into the empty darkness and we followed them. I tried to go to sleep. The jolting made me bite my tongue and I soon began to ache all over. Cautiously, I slipped from under the buffalo hide, got up on my knees and peered over the side of the wagon. There seemed to be nothing to see. <laughs> no fences, no creeks or trees, no hills or fields. If there was a road, I could not make it out in the faint starlight. There was nothing but land, not a country at all but the material out of which countries are made. I had the feeling that the world was left behind, that we had got over the edge of it and were outside the its jurisdiction. I had never before looked up at the sky when there was not a familiar mountain ridge against it. But this was the complete dome of heaven, all there was of it. I did not believe that my dead father and mother were watching me from up there. They would still be looking for me at the sheepfold down by the creek or along the white road that led to the mountain pastures. I had left even their spirits behind me. The wagon jolted on, carrying me and not with her. I don't think I was homesick. We never arrived anywhere, it did not matter. Between that earth and that sky, I felt erased. Blotted out. I did not say my prayers that night. Here I felt what would be, would be. I do not remember our arrival at my grandfather's farm sometime before daybreak after a drive of nearly 20 miles with heavy workforce. The road from the post office came directly by our door, crossed the farmyard, and curved around this little pond beyond which it began to climb the gentle swell of unbroken prairie to the west. There, along the western skyline, it skirted a great cornfield, much larger than any field I had ever seen. I had almost forgotten that I had a grandmother when she came out. Her sunbonnet on her head, a grain of sack in her hand, and asked me if I did not want to go to the garden with her to dig potatoes for dinner. The garden was a quarter of a mile from the house, <laughs> and the way to it led up a shallow draw past a cattle corral. I can remember exactly how the country looked to me as I walked beside my grandmother along the faint wagon tracks on that early September morning. Perhaps the glide of the long railway travel was still with me, for more than anything else, I felt motion in the landscape, in the fresh, easy blowing morning wind, and in the earth itself, as if the shaggy grass were a sort of loose hide, and underneath it herds of wild buffalo. Gallery. Alone, I should never have found the garden, but I felt very little interest in it when I got there. I wanted to walk straight on through the red grass and over the edge of the world, which could not be very far away. Grandmother took the pitchfork we found standing in one of the rows and dug potatoes while I picked them up out of the soft brown earth and put them into the bag. When grandmother was ready to go, I said I should like to stay a while. I sat down in the middle of the garden, where snakes could hardly approach unseen, and leaned my back against a warm yellow pumpkin. The earth was warm under me, and warm as I crumbled it through my fingers. I kept as still as I could. Nothing happened. I did not expect anything to happen. I was something that lay under the sun and felt it, like the pumpkins, and I did not want to be anything more. I was entirely happy. <coughs> Perhaps we feel like that when we die and become a part of something entire, whether it is sun and air or goodness and knowledge. At any rate, 
That is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. When it comes to one, it comes as naturally as sleep. The song of the lark. Wunsch was in bed for 10 days, during which time he was gossiping about and even preached about in Moonstone. The Baptist preacher took a shot at the fallen man from his pulpit. Mrs. Livery Johnson nodded approvingly from her pew. The mothers of Wunsch's pupils sent him notes informing him that their daughters would discontinue their music lessons. The old maid who had rented him her piano sent the town dray for her contaminated instrument and ever afterward declared that Wunsch had ruined its tone and scarred its glossy finish. The Kohlers were unremitting in their kindness to their friend. Mrs. Kohler made him soups and broths without stint and Fritz repaired the duck house and mounted it on a new post, lest it might be a sad reminder. As soon as Wunsch was strong enough to sit about in his slippers and water jacket, he told Fritz to bring him uh, some stout thread from the shop. When Fritz asked what he was going to sew, he produced the tattered score of Orpheus and said he would like to fix it up for a little present. <laughs> Fritz carried it over to the shop and stitched it into the pasteboards covered with dark suiting cloth. Over the stitches, he glued a strip of thin red leather, which he got from his friend, the harness maker. After Paulina had cleaned the pages, Wunsch was amazed to see what a fine book he had. It opened stiffly, but that was no matter. Sitting in the arbor one morning under the ripe grapes and the brown curling leaves, with a pen and ink on the bench beside him and the Gluck score on his knee, Wunsch pondered for a long while. Several times he dipped his pen in the ink and then put it back again in the cigar box in which Mrs. Kohler kept her writing utensils. His thoughts wandered over a wide territory, over many countries and many years. <clears throat> he frowned for a moment and looked at the book on his knee. He had thought of a great many appropriate things to write in it, but suddenly he rejected all of them. Opened the book, and at the top of the much engraved title page, he wrote rapidly in purple ink, Einst o Wunja, A. Wunsch, Moonstone, Colorado, September 30, 1895. Nobody in Moonstone ever found what Wunsch's first name was. <laughs> the A may have stood for Adam or August or even Amadeus. <laughs> he got very angry if anyone asked him. He remained a bush <laughs> to the end of his chapter there. When he presented this score to Taya, he told her that in 10 years, she would either know what the inscription meant, or she would not have the least idea, in which case it would not matter. <laughs> when Wunsch began to pack his brother, both the callers were very unhappy. He said he was coming back someday, but that for the present, since he had lost all his pupils, it would be better for him to try some new town. Wunsch would not go across the ravine to the town until he went to take the morning train for Denver. He said that after he got to Denver, he would look around. He left Moonstone one bright October morning without telling anyone goodbye. He brought his ticket and went directly into the smoking car. When the train was beginning to pull out, he heard his name called frantically. And looking out the window, he saw Taya Kronborg standing in the siding, bareheaded and panting. Some boys had brought word to school that they saw Wunsch's trunk going over to the station, and Taya had run away from school. She was at the end of the station platform, her hair in two braids. Her blue gingham dress wet to the knees because she had run across lots through the weeds. It had rained during the night, and the tall sunflowers behind her were fresh and shining. Goodbye, Herr Wunsch. Goodbye, she called, waving to him. He thrust his head out of the car window and called back, Leben Sie wohl, Leben Sie wohl, mein Kind. He 
watched her until the train swept around the curve beyond the roundhouse and then sank back into a seat, muttering, she has been running. Ah, she will run a long way. They, they cannot stop her. What was it about the child that one believed in? That night, Mrs. Kohler brushed away many a tear as she got supper and set the table for two. Mrs. Kohler stirred while well, when they sat down, Fritz was more silent than usual. Mrs. Kohler stirred and stirred her coffee and clattered her spoon, but she had no heart for her supper. She felt for the first time in years that she was tired of her own cooking. <laughs> she looked across the glass lamp at her husband and asked him if the butcher liked his new overcoat and whether he had got the shoulders right in a ready-made suit he was patching over for Ray Kennedy. After supper, Fritz offered to wipe the dishes for her, but she told him to go about his business and not to act as if she were sick or getting helpless. When her work in the kitchen was all done, she went out to cover the oleanders against the frost and to take a last look at her chickens. And as she came back from her hen house, she stopped by one of the linden trees and stood resting her hand on the trunk. He would never come back, the poor man. She knew that. He would drift on from new town to new town, from catastrophe to catastrophe. He would hardly find a good home for himself again. He would die at last in some rough place and be buried in the desert or on the wind prairie, far enough from any linden tree. Briggs, smoking his pipe on the kitchen doorstep, watched his Pauline and guessed her thoughts. He too was sorry to lose his friend, but Fritz was getting old. He had lived a long while and had learned to lose without struggle. Old Mrs. Harris. Old Mrs. Harris did not really die that night, but she believed she did. <laughs> Mandy found her unconscious in the morning. Then there was a great stir and bustle, but grandmother was out of all of it never knew that she was the object of so much attention and excitement. She died a little while after Mr. Templeton got home. Thus, Mrs. Harris slipped out of the Templeton story, but Victoria and Vicky had still to go on, to follow the long road that leads through things unguessed at and unforeseeable. When they are old, they will come closer and closer to Grandma Harris. They will think a great deal about her and remember things. And their lot will be more or less like hers. They will regret that they heeded her so little, but they too will submit to the eager, unseeing eyes of young people and feel themselves alone. They will say to themselves, I was heartless because I was young and wanted things so much. But now I know. A lost lady. He had seen the end of an era, the sunset of the pioneer. He had come upon it when already its glory was nearly spent. So in the Buffalo times, a traveler used to come up upon the embers of a hunter's fire on the prairie. After the hunter was up and gone, the coals would be trampled out, but the ground was warm. The flattened grass where he had slept and where his pony had grazed told the story. This was the very end of the road making west. The men who had put plains and mountains under the iron harness were old. Some were poor, and even the successful ones were hunting for a rest and a brief reprieve from death. It was already gone that age. Nothing could ever bring it back. <coughs> the taste and smell and song, the visions those men had seen in the air and followed, these he had caught in a kind of afterglow in their own faces, and this would always be his. The Song of the Lark. So many grinning, stupid faces. 
Faye was sitting by the window in Bauer's studio waiting for him to come back for lunch. On the knee was the famous illustrated musical journal in which musicians great and a little stridently advertised their wares. Every afternoon, she played accompaniments for people who looked and smiled like these. In the afternoon, Bowers teach professionals and taught his advanced pupils. It was his theory that Taya ought to be able to learn a great deal by keeping her ears open while she played for them. The concert-going public of Chicago still remembers the long, sallow, discontented face of Madison Bowers. He seldom missed an evening concert and was usually to be seen lounging somewhere at the back of the concert hall, reading a newspaper and conspicuously ignoring the efforts of the performers. At the end of a number, he looked up from his paper long enough to sweep the applauding audience with a contemptuous eye. Bowers had all the qualities which go to make a good teacher, except generosity and warmth. His intelligence was of a high order, his taste never at fault. He seldom worked with the voice without improving it, and in teaching the delivery of oratorio, he was without a run. Singers came from far and near to study Bach and Handel with him. Even the fashionable sopranos and contraptos of Chicago, St. Paul, and St. Louis, they were usually ladies with very rich husbands, <laughs> humbly endured his sardonic humor for the sake of what he could do for them. He was not at all above helping a very lame singer across if her husband's checkbook warranted it. He had a whole bag of tricks for stupid people. Life preservers, he called them. Cheap repairs for a cheap one, he used to say. But the husbands never found repairs very cheap. The soloists came to Chicago to coach with Bowers, and he often took long journeys to hear and instruct chorus. He was intensely avaricious. And from these semi-professionals, he reaped a golden harvest. They fed his pockets, and they fed his ever humble of contempt his score of himself and of his accomplices. The more money he made, the more parsimonious he became. He had first been interested in Taya Kronberg because of her bluntness, her country roughness, and her manifest carefulness about money. For the first time, Taya had a friend who, in his own cool and guarded way, liked her for what was least admirable in her. <laughs> Taya was still looking at the musical paper when Bowers sauntered in. I may cut my lesson out tomorrow, Mr. Bowers. I have to hunt a new boarding place. Bowers looked up languidly from his desk where he had begun to go over a pile of letters. And what's the matter with the studio club? Been fighting with them again? The club's all right for people who like to live that way. I don't. <laughs> Bowers lifted his eyebrows. Why so temporary? He asked. I can't work with a lot of girls around. They're too familiar. I never could get along with girls of my own age. It's all too chummy, it's on my nerves. <laughs> I didn't come here to play kindergarten. Taya began energetically to arrange the scattered music on the piano. Bowers grimaced good humoredly at her over the three checks he was pinning together. He liked to play at a rough game of banter with her. He flattered himself that he had made her harsher than she was when she first came to him, that he had gone off a little of the sugar coating on his people. The art of making yourself agreeable never comes amiss, Miss Kronberg. I should say you rather need a little practice along that line. When you come to marketing your wares in the world, a little smoothness goes further and a great deal of talent sometimes. If you happen to be cursed with a real talent, then you've got to be very smooth indeed, or you'll never get your money back. Bowers snatched the elastic band around his notebook. Taya gave him a sharp, recognizing glance. Well, that's the money I'll have to go without, she replied. Bowers rose and closed his desk. Mrs. Priest is late again. By the way, Ms. Cronk, remember not to frown when you are playing for Mrs. Priest? You did not remember yesterday. You mean when she hits a tone with her breath like that? Why do you let her? You wouldn't let me. Oh, I certainly would not. But that is a mannerism of Mrs. Priest's. The public like it, and they pay a great deal of money for the pleasure of hearing her do it. There she is. Remember. 
Bowers opened the door of the reception room and a tall, imposing woman rustled in, bringing with her a glow of animation which pervaded the room as if a half dozen persons, all talking gaily, had come in instead of one. She was large, handsome, expansive, uncontrolled. One felt this the moment she crossed the threshold. She showed with care and cleanliness, mature vigor, unchallenged authority, gracious good humor, and absolute confidence in her person, her powers, her position, and her way of life. A glowing, overwhelming self-satisfaction only can be found where human society is young and strong and without yesterdays. Her face had a kind of a heavy, thoughtless beauty, like a pink peony, just at the point of beginning to fade. Her brown hair was waved in front and done up behind in a great twist, held by a tortoiseshell comb and gold filigree. She wore a beautiful little green hat with three long feathers sticking straight up in front, a little cape made of velvet and fur with a yellow satin rose on it. Her gloves, her shoes, her veil somehow made themselves felt. She gave the impression of wearing a cargo of splendid merchandise. <laughs> Mrs. Priest nodded graciously to Taya coquettishly to Bowers, and asked him to untie her veil for her. She threw her splendid wrap on a chair, the yellow lining out. Taya was already at the piano. Mrs. Priest stood behind her. Rejoice greatly first, please, and please don't hurry it in there. She put her arm over Taya's shoulder and indicated the passage by a sweep of her white glove. She threw out her chest, clasped her hand over her abdomen, lifted her chin, worked the muscles of her cheeks back and forth for a moment, and then began with conviction. Bowers faced the room with his cat-like tread. When he checked Mrs. Priest's vehement at all, he handled her roughly, poked and hammered her massive person with cold satisfaction, almost as if he were taking out a grudge on his splendid creation. Such treatment the opposing lady did not at all resent. She tried harder and harder, her eyes growing all the while more lustrous and her lips redder. Taya played on as she was told, ignoring the singer's struggles. When she first heard Mrs. Priest sing in church, Taya admired her. Since she had found out how dull the good-natured soprano really was, she felt a deep contempt for her. She felt that Mrs. Priest ought to be reproved and even punished for her shortcomings, that she ought to be exposed, at least to herself, and not be permitted to live and shine in happy ignorance of what a poor thing it was she brought across so radiantly. Taya's cold looks of reproof were lost upon Mrs. Priest, although the lady did murmur one day when she took Bowers home in her carriage, how handsome your afternoon girl would be if she did not have that unfortunate squint. <laughs> it gives her that vacant Swede look, like an animal. That amused Bowers. He liked to watch the tribulation and growth of antipathies. <laughs> One of ours, 1923. By the banks of Lovely Creek, where it all began, Claude Wheeler's story still goes on. To the two old women who work together in the farmhouse, the thought of him is always there, beyond everything else at the farthest edge of consciousness, like the evening sun on the horizon. Mrs. Wheeler got the word of his death one afternoon in the sitting room, the room in which he had bade her goodbye. She was reading when the telephone rang. Is this the Wheeler Farm? This is the telegraph office. We have a message from the War Department. The voice hesitated. Isn't Mr. Wheeler there? No, but you can read the message to me. Mrs. Wheeler said, thank you, and hung up the receiver. She felt her way softly to the chair. She had an hour alone when there was nothing but him in the room, but him and the map of Germany there, which was the end of his road. Somewhere among those perplexing names, he had found his place. Claude's letters kept coming for weeks afterwards. Then came the letters from his comrades and his colonel to tell her all. In the dark months that followed, 
When human nature looked to her uglier than it had ever done before, those letters were Mrs. Wheeler's comfort. <coughs> As she read the newspapers, she used to think about the passage of the Red Sea in the Bible. It seemed as if the flood of meanness and greed had been held back just long enough for the boys to go over and then swept down and engulfed everything that was left at home. When she can see nothing that has come of it but evil, she reads Claude's letters over again and reassures herself. For him, the call was clear. The cause was glorious. Never a doubt stained his bright faith. She divined so much that he did not write. She knows what to read into those short flashes of enthusiasm. How fully he must have found his life before he could let himself go so far. He, who was so afraid of being fooled, he died believing his own country better than it is, and France better than any country can ever be. <laughs> and those were beautiful beliefs to die with. Perhaps it was as well to see that vision and then to see no more. She would have dreaded the awakening. She sometimes even doubts whether he could have borne at all that last desolating disappointment. One by one, the heroes of that war, the men of dazzling soldiership, leave prematurely the world they have come back to. Airmen whose deeds were tales of wonder, officers whose names made the blood of youth beat faster, survivors of incredible dangers, one by one, they quietly die by their own hand. Some do it in obscure lodging houses, some in their offices, where they seem to be carrying on their business like, like other men. Some slip over a vessel's side and disappear. When Claude's mother hears of these things, she shudders and presses her hands tight over her breast as if she had him there. She feels as if God had saved him from some horrible suffering, some horrible end. For as she reads, she thinks those slayers of themselves were so like him. They were the ones who had hoped extravagantly, who in order to do what they did, had to hope extravagantly and to believe passionately. And they found they had hoped and believed too much. Mahaley, when they were alone, sometimes addresses Mrs. Wheeler as mother. Now, mother, you go upstairs and lay down and rest yourself. Mrs. Wheeler knows that, that then she is thinking of Claude, is speaking for Claude. As they are working at the table or bending over the oven, something reminds them of him. And they think of him together. Like one person. Mahaley will pat her on the back and say, never you mind, mother. You'll see your boy up yonder. Mrs. Wheeler always feels that God is near, but Mahaley is not troubled by any knowledge of interstellar spaces. <laughs> and for her, he is nearer still. Directly overhead, not so very far above the kitchen stove. Lucy Gayhart. In little towns, lives roll along so close to one another, lights and hates beat about, their wings almost touching. On the sidewalks along which everybody comes and goes, you must at some time pass within a few inches of the man who cheated and betrayed you, or the woman you desire more than anything else in the world. You say good morning and go on. It is a close shave. Out in the world, the escapes are not so narrow. When he came out of the house, the last intense light of the winter day was pouring over the town below him, and the treetops and the church steeples gleamed like copper. After all, he was thinking, he would never go away from Haverford. He'd been through too much here. What was a man's hometown anyway but the place where he had learned to have disappointments and had learned to bear them? On August 24th, 1984, the day before his death at 59, from a probable overdose of pills, Truman Capote was started this reminiscence. All of my relatives are Southern, <laughs> either from New Orleans or the rural regions of Alabama. 
At least 40 of the men and possibly more died during the Civil War, including my great grandfather. Long ago, when I was 10 or thereabouts, I became interested in these fallen soldiers because I had read a large collection of their battlefield letters that our family had made for me. I was already interested in writing. In fact, had published small essays and stories in Scholastic Magazine. <laughs> and I decided to write an historical book based on the letters of these Confederate heroes. Troubles interfered, and it was not until eight years later, when I was barely surviving as a very young journalist living in New York, that the subject of my Civil War kinfolk revived. Of course, a great amount of research was necessary. The place I chose to do this research was the New York Society Library, <laughs> for several reasons. <laughs> One being that it was winter, and this particular place warm and clean and situated just out Park Avenue provided a cozy haven the whole day long. Also, perhaps because of its location, the staff and clientele were a comfort in themselves. <laughs> a bunch of upper-class, well-mannered literati. <laughs> Some of the customers I saw frequently at the library were more than that, especially the blue-eyed lady. Her eyes were the pale blue of a prairie dawn on a clear day. Also, there was something wholesome and countrified about her face, and it was not just an absence of cosmetics. She was of ordinary height and of a solid but not overly solid shape. Her clothing was composed of an unusual but somehow attractive combination of materials. She wore low heel shoes, and thick stockings, and a handsome turquoise necklace that went well with her soft tweed suits. Her hair was black and white and crisply, almost mannishly cut. The surprising dominant factor was a beautiful sable coat which she almost never took off. <laughs> it was a good thing she had it on the day of the storm. When I left the library around four o'clock, it looked as though the North Pole had moved to New York. Fist-sized snowballs pummeled the air. The blue-eyed lady wearing a rich stable coat was standing at the curb. She was trying to hail a taxi. I decided to help her, but there were no taxis in view. Indeed, very little traffic. I said, maybe all the drivers have gone home. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I live not too far from here. Her deep, soft voice drifted toward me through the heavy snow. So I asked, then may I walk you home? <laughs> she smiled. We walked along together along Madison Avenue until we reached a Longchamps restaurant. She said, I could use a cup of tea, could you? I said, yes. But once we were settled at the table, I ordered a double martini. <laughs> she laughed and asked if I was old enough to drink. <laughs> Whereupon I told her all about myself, my age, the fact I was born in New Orleans, and that I was an aspiring writer. What writers did you admire? Obviously, she was not a New Yorker. She had a Western accent. Flaubert. Tugania, Proust, Charles Dickens, E. M. Forster, Conan Doyle, Maupassant, she laughed. Well, you certainly are varied, except aren't there any American writers you care for? Like who? Sarah Horn Jewett, Edith Wharton. Miss Jewett wrote one good book. The Country of the Pointed Birds, and Edith Wharton wrote one good book, The House of Mirths. But I like Henry James, Mark Twain, Melville, and I love Willa Cather. Love My Antonia, death comes for the Archbishop. Have you ever read her marvelous two novellas, A Lost Lady and My Mortal Enemy? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> she sipped her tea and put the cup down with a slightly nervous gesture. She seemed to be turning something over in her mind. I ought to tell you. She paused, then in a rushing voice, more or less whispered, I wrote those books. <laughs> <laughs> I was stunned. How could I have been so stupid? 
I had a photograph of her in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she was Willa Cather. <laughs> Those flawless sky-like eyes, the bobbed hair, the square face with a firm chin. I hovered between laughter and tears. There was no living person I would rather have met. No one who could have so impressed me, not Garbo or Gandhi or Einstein or Churchill or Stalin. Nobody. She apparently realized that, and we were both left speechless. I swallowed my double martini in one go. <laughs> but soon we were on the street again. We trudged through the snow until we arrived at an expensive old fashioned address on Park Avenue. She said, yeah, Well, here's where I live. Then suddenly added, If you're free for dinner on Thursday, I'll expect you at seven o'clock. And please bring some of your writing. I'd like to read it. Yes. I was thrilled. I bought a new suit and retyped three of my short stories. And come Thursday, I was on her doorstep promptly at seven. I was still amazed to think that Willa Cather wore sable coats and occupied a Park Avenue apartment. <laughs> I had always imagined her as living on a quiet street in Red Cloud, Nebraska. <laughs> the apartment did not have many rooms, but they were very large rooms, which she shared with a lifelong companion, someone her own size and age, a discreetly elegant woman named Edith Lewis. Miss Cather and Miss Lewis were so alike, one could be certain they had decorated the apartment together. There were flowers everywhere, masses of winter lilac, peonies, and lavender colored roses, beautifully bound books lined all the walls of the living room. My darling Edith, I am sitting in your room, looking out in the woods you know so well. Everything delights me. I am ashamed of my appetite for food. And as for sleep, I have forgotten that sleeping can be an active, physical pleasure. I wake up saturated with the pleasure of breathing clear mountain air, of being up high with all the woods below me, sleeping in still white moonlight. One hour from now, out of your window, I shall see a sight unparalleled. Jupiter and Venus both shining in the golden rosy sky and both in the west. From 5.30 to 6.30, they are of a superb splendor, deepening in color in a still daylight sky, guiltless of other stars. The moon not up and the sun gone down. Those two above, the whole vault of heaven. I can't but believe that all that majesty and beauty, all those unfailing appearances and exit are more than just mathematics and horrible temperatures. If they are not, then we are the only wonderful things because we can wonder. I have worn my white silk suit almost constantly with no white hat, which is awkward. <laughs> Everything you packed carried wonderfully, not a wrinkle. Now, I must dress to receive the planets, dear, as I won't wish to take time after they appear, and the planets will not wait. Lovingly, W. I don't know when I have enjoyed Jupiter so much as this summer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>